You getting the music? Music? Just play anything. Just play anything from that list. Um, hold on one second. I thought it was playing because it's playing on my screen. Um, I don't hear it. No, I don't hear it either. Okay, hold on one second. Um, Out on him. You hear it now? Yes. Lower, Suppose lower. the working you so hard it's just outrageous and they're paying you all starvation wages. You go to the boss and the boss would yell, before I raise your pay I'd see you all in hell. Well he's puffing a big cigar, feeling mighty slick cause he thinks he's got your union lick. Well he looks out the window and what does he see but a thousand pickets and they all agree he's a bastard. Unfair! Slave driver. Betty beats his wife. Now, boys, you come to the hardest time. The boss will try to bust you. Can somebody please send Connie Gemson the link for the meeting today? She just asked me for it. Who oh, yeah. is? Japanese. Connie. A 
us to freedom, freedom, freedom. It will carry us to freedom, freedom, freedom. It will carry us to freedom, freedom, freedom. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Get on board, board, get on board. Oh, what is that I see yonder coming, coming, coming? Oh, what is that I see yonder coming, coming, coming? What is that I see yonder coming, coming, coming? Get on board, get on board. It's that you. Train coming, 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 so I, I think we should begin. Uh, Samantha and uh, John Herrick are staffing this meeting. And uh, I want to thank them at the beginning because they have a very important role. Um, OK. <laughs> um, Samantha tells me that we have almost 300 people registered, so I don't know how many are actually going to attend today, but we're over 100 already, and we have a very, very long program, and we want to give you uh, as individuals the opportunity to speak at the open mic, so we're going to get started. Um, my name is Ann Friedman. I am the new retiree chapter chair. I'm very honored and privileged to host this really special meeting of the retirees chapter. I'm also uh, the first woman to chair the retirees chapter. And uh, I'm joined by two other fantastic women, our um, vice chair, Diane Mena, and our secretary, Bonnie Nelson. And of course, our dedicated and brilliant executive committee of 25 plus. And there are many wonderful things about the retiree chapter, but one of the best is that we really are a team and uh, everybody works together, helps each other out. And um, I think we are really are a model of a collaborative um, work group. Well, um, New leaders build on the knowledge and the spirit and the energy of those who come before us. So I don't think we can begin today's commemoration without paying tribute to my predecessor, Bill Friedheim. BMCC must provide fertile ground for BMCC leaders because both Bill and I are retired from um, BMCC and, and one of our uh, speakers coming up momentarily is also a retiree from BMCC. But we welcome, you know, everybody, uh, wherever you worked, wherever you are working now. And um, I think uh, this is going to be a wonderful event. So to start us off, I'm going to call on Jim Perlstein, a lifelong friend and colleague of Bill's, to say a few words. Jim? Thanks, Ann. Um, I've known Bill almost 60 years. Um, with most of us, what you see is what you get. And what I mean is the Perlstein you know is the Pearlstein you quite reasonably come to expect. No surprises, nothing much new, tiresome even. Um, and in some ways that describes Bill as well. We all know that sure as the sun will rise, Bill will take any opportunity to commend the conquering spirit of all and sundry. Uh, we know for certain that he'll follow that with the warning that we can't expect to suck solutions out of our thumbs. And we all know that Bill, having come up with some really sharp, really funny remark, will be sorely tempted to beat it to death and close with an apology for his bad jokes. But that sort of stuff aside, 
Bill isn't like the rest of us. Mm. He has more capacity for growth than anyone I've known. It's not so much the range of his commitments or even the sense of solidarity implicit in those commitments as it is his ability to blossom in each and every one of them. Let me count the ways as a teacher at BMCC, as a teacher of teachers with the American Social History Project, as a historian of reconstruction, as a department administrator, as a union organizer, union activist, and union leader, as a media guru, at um, least to this Bush leaguer. I do want to keep the same um, money. Uh, I'm uh, on it. My problem somebody, right now is I. Uh, somebody's got to shut their wait, mic wait, wait. down. Somebody has to shut a mic. Jim, you are muted now, unfortunately. All right, so um, where did I leave off? Um, and I lost my, I lost my text. Um, teacher of uh, social history, teacher of teachers. Yeah, I'm, um, all That's right. when you got well, muted. I'm gonna have to wing it now because I'd, <laughs> I'd written stuff, I'd written stuff down. Um, you know, as, as a union organizer, union activist, as, as a, a media person, um, uh, as most recently, um, uh, our uh, Medicare crisis uh, manager. Um, but in, um, in everything um, and always uh, a colleague and a friend. Um, and, uh, I'm not sure how he does it. Maybe he sucks it out of his thumb. Uh, but in any event, uh, thanks for me and thanks from all of us. So I turn it back to Anne. I'll unmute myself. Can people hear me? Hello? Yes, Ann. Okay, sorry. Okay. I know everybody will bear with us with, you know. You know. So, okay. So uh, anyway, I now I'd like to ask John Highland, a retiree from LaGuardia Community College and our PSE treasurer from 2000 to 2006. And of course, a lifelong leader and activist to read a resolution honoring Bill. John? Yep, thank you, Ann. PSC retiree chapter resolution celebrating Bill Friedheim. Whereas Bill Friedheim has led the PSC retiree chapter for nine years with boundless energy, wisdom, and skill, addressing the major crises of the COVID 19 pandemic and the challenge of the Medicare Advantage struggle. And whereas Bill's leadership comes out of a long history of participation in working class movements in the community on issues of housing, anti-racism, anti-militarism, environmental justice, and in the workplace on open admissions, free tuition and contract campaigns. And whereas Bill has been a model and a mentor of democratic participatory unionism when facing the above crises, his extensive outreach to other unions and organizations has built the chapter and the union. Whereas Bill's wisdom and skill are an extension of his whole career at BMCC and throughout CUNY, his scholarship and teaching, his involvement in and development of cutting edge content and pedagogy in the American Social History Project, his role in advancing the communication process within the PSC as webmaster, his continued focus on the lives of students and their communities, his ability to synthesize and balance these many and more dimensions of a rich and deep life, 
And whereas Bill's personal characteristics match and enhance his organizational work, they are an integral part of his effectiveness, namely comradely warmth, friendship, empathy, strength, patience, grace under pressure, humor. Can't hear you, John. John, you got muted. I'll go back then. Whereas Bill's personal characteristics match and enhance his organizational work and are an integral part of his effectiveness, comradely warmth, friendship, empathy, strength, patience, grace under pressure, humor, respect for the strengths and differences of others, and openness to the suggestions and proposals of a diverse membership. And whereas Bill's chairmanship addressed not only social political challenges, but also supported the cultural interests of members, theater events, art, architecture, film programs, outings to New York Mets games, walking tours of New York City, retiree reading groups, and writing projects. Therefore, be it resolved that the PSC Retirees Chapter expresses its deepest gratitude and appreciation for Bill Friedheim's engagement, participation, and leadership in our work and our lives. And I'd like to ask members of the retiree chapter to um, affirm this resolution by unanimous consent and saying I, and I think Samantha's going to unmute all of us. So do I hear? Aye. 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 All right, you know, eventually we'll be able to meet at 61 Broadway and, uh, and we won't have the technical challenges. Okay, well, we have a special gift for Bill, uh, and I'm going to call on Joan Greenbaum, a former LaGuardia Community College chapter chair, an essential leader in our health and safety agenda, and one of the co-editors of our newsletter, Turning the Page, and she has something special for Bill. Joan? Thanks, Ann. Can we have a spotlight on Bill, please? <laughs> How you doing, Bill? I'm doing very well right now. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay. Well, since you're coming, you know. Almost, almost finished. Just I've never had such small... nice things said about me. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. <laughs> a few things left. So one is, since you are webmaster and you always do the sh picture shows, um, we'll do a small, small, tiny, tiny slideshow for you. And uh, Samantha has it. Here we go. <laughs> In the great sense, Santa. <laughs> So, uh, Bill and everyone, there are no naked pictures of baby pictures in here. It's just, you have to guess where, you, where we were. Board of Trustees 80 is... <laughs> no, no, it's Bill's job. Oh, oh. Uh, thanks for to Marsha, Board of Trustees at 80th Street. Okay. <laughs> I need and this more one? cues and help here. With Joel Berger, and I don't know what we're signing here. <laughs> Looks but dangerous. We look very intense. Where is this? At the PSC. At the PSC. What is it? Okay. It's supposed to, the slideshow is supposed to go on. <laughs> what happened here? <clears throat> um, Technologies of Joel and I in perpetuity signing something for oh, yeah. hours and hours. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. <clears throat> At one of many demonstrations. 
this. Uh, at a Mets game. And I hear you brought a lifelong fan, Yankee fan to multiple Met, Mets games. And here. Uh, and yes, the communications team at the PSC uh, had a uh, beer drinking club, uh, and I drank my share. <laughs> and this? Well, it's got to be recent since I'm wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> City Hall. Bill City. thinks. I don't know. All right, Bill. Who are these you strange know. guys with you? Hmm? Uh, Jim and John, obviously. Okay. Thank you. And then we have just two more tiny things left to celebrate Bill and remind others. One is a book of tribute. Which I understand was delivered on Friday, so the surprise is done. Um, but we hear that you loved it. Any comments? Well, I'll comment when you're finished. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Joan, because we have to move the program. Okay. Well, just we're hoping that you will put uh some of these or all of it on the website did you consider that well uh, samantha uh amanda will have to send me the pdf of the, uh... right so it is amanda malgalis who is <laughs> together with the photos and she's part of your communications team and for those of you who really don't know Bill is the webmaster of the PSC website. Um, Bill, I'm not quite finished, but you get to say something. Uh, okay, well, um, you're making an old guy blush like a two-year-old. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is so sweet, so nice. Um, you know, I guess I, I should, according to a Q, you know, given Jim's remarks, tell you that I'm going to suck a thank you out of my thumb um, and commend all of you for your concrete you spirit. In? But am I, can you hear me? Yes. And I don't think we meant to put you on the spot, Bill. Um, uh, no, that's okay. I, I think so. We have one more thing, right, Joan? Oh, but you can finish. Okay. No, no, no. I just want to say that. Working with the retirees EC, working with the entire retiree chapter uh, has been a real joy. I mean, what we do is organizing and activism, particularly this past year uh, around Medicare Advantage, uh, just been a tremendous privilege working with everybody. Uh, and yes, it was a lot of hard work, but it brought a lot of joy to my life. Uh, and, you know, I just love my brothers and sisters in the PSC. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And don't make me blush so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Bill. And okay, I'm going to take here. It. There's oh. just one more thing. And that is that today is actually, hi, somebody's not muted. Um, today is actually Bill's birthday. So oh, oh, wow. to have, us have a rousing cheer and everybody will get unmuted at this point. Samantha, can yep. that be done? Yep. And uh, Connie will lead us because if I did, it would be off key. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Bill. Happy Happy birthday birthday to you. To you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, thank Yay. you. Right. Sound like 126 yeah. people, but well, we care. But we enthusiasm. We have a harp, rend beautiful harp rendition of Happy Birthday, but the technical piece doesn't always work out, Bill. Well, I'll, we'll send you the link and maybe we can do it later. So thank you, Joan. Okay, well, uh, I think- Wait, I need to mute everybody again. Sorry, Anne, that's okay. gonna include you. Hold on. Yeah. All right, so now unmute yourself again. Okay, you need to unmute yourself, Anne. Sorry. Unmute, Anne.
you. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on now to the um, the real. Well, I shouldn't say the real meat, but the the um, the major part of our program today. Um, and uh, as you all know, I'm sure that 50 years ago on April 14th, 1972, the Legislative Conference merged with the United Federation of College Teachers to form the PSE that we know today. Uh, last week, Bill forwarded to me a post of one of our many retiree uh, chapter members who was present at the founding of the union. Uh, his name is George Crouch. George is 98 years old. Um, I don't know if he's our oldest retiree in the chapter, but um, that is a lifetime of uh, many things that George has done in addition to leading the CLT chapter uh, early on, and I believe for, for quite a long time. Uh, George is the veteran of two wars, uh, a COVID survivor, and we invited him to come to the open mic. And I don't know if he's here and we'll be able to do that. But anyway, um, well, that's just one of the scores of 50 year plus members uh, who we are honoring today. And uh, together we will celebrate our union as a fighting princi principled and big tent um, union. To start the program, I'm gonna call on Erwin Yellowitz, City College retiree, past, pres past president of our chapter, and he will talk to you about the first 25 years. Okay, and thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be uh, discussing the first 25 years. If you wanna know more about it, uh, I did write a booklet for the PSC when I retired and uh, it's called 25 Years of Progress. And it uh, is available on the PSC website. You go to uh, About Us and then PSC History to those tabs and you'll find it. Or it's also available on the CUNY Digital History Archive, where there's also another section that I curated about the founding of the PSC. So if you wanna know more about uh, these things that I'm gonna be covering briefly today, you can certainly uh, go there. Now I've uh, talked to uh, groups of PSC in um, service members about the history of the union on a number of occasions. And uh, usually when I tell them that I joined the uh, UFCT, United Federation of College Teachers, in 1965, there's a gasp. The gasp being, as they say, is he really that old? And was there really a union back in 1965? And the answer is, of course, yes, there was a union. And... Uh, there was also the Legislative Conference, which was not a union at that time, but was a well-established lobbying organization. These two organizations combined in 1972 to form the PSC. Today, there are gonna be no gasps because many of you have long, long histories with the union. And actually, uh, Bill Friedheim and I served together on the UFCT executive board in, 19, uh, in the late 1960s. And there are many others here who go back uh, to that period. So what I'm gonna try to do is briefly recover some of the major events that uh, took place in the first 25 years. First of all, there was uh, a um, leadership issue because when the merger took place, we had two leaders, very strong people, Belzella and Israel Kugler, who uh, led their own organizations. And because they merged together does not mean that they, that one or the other accepted that, that uh, they were not the primary force in the union. And uh, in the uh, first election that was held in 1973, 
Uh, Bell won by only 200 votes and the executive council and delegate assembly was split. So there was a real leadership issue. And while this leadership issue was going on, we were confronting the fiscal crisis, uh, the first contract, the tenure quotas, a whole series of serious events, but the leadership did not allow their internal um, conflict to uh, take them away from leadership of the union. And I think that is very important. We've been a democratic union and we've always survived and um, uh, made a strength out of the differences within the union. Bell, of course, went back to the 1930s. She was one of the first female professors at Brooklyn College. Uh, she was a leader of the LC from 1944, a woman in 1944 being president of a uh, major faculty organization, not very common. And of course she was a lobbyist. She wrote on lobbying and she, everybody in Albany knew her. Israel Kugler had organized a union at the predecessor to City Tech uh, in the early, uh, in the um, middle 1940s. He was a strong proponent of having uh, college faculty and staff part of the labor movement. And he also was uh, very closely connected to the UFT. So you had these two very strong people. Uh, the conflict ended in 1976 when Israel Kugler ran against Erwin Polishuk. Bell had now retired and uh, Erwin won that election decisively and Is Kugler disbanded his caucus and many of his people joined the majority group and formed a very strong uh, united group in the 1980s. Now, during this period, think of what else was happening. We had to negotiate a first contract with an intransient management, which like many employers is very tough on a first contract. They try to overcome the fact that they've lost um, uh, the uh, status situation that they now have a union present by making it almost impossible to negotiate a contract. We took strike votes. Uh, we went out to the public and eventually we prevailed because the fact finding group that was brought in under the state law uh, basically agreed with the position of the union and management had to give in. But that was a very tough, very tough battle. It was followed almost immediately by a um, called by the chancellor, Robert Kibbe, to set up tenure quotas at 50% of each department, maximum of 50%. This actually was passed by the board in October of 1973. We fought it very hard, uh, including boycotting the chancellor, refusing to meet with him, and most of the faculty bodies in the university, the faculty councils and senates agreed. Uh, and again, we made it very clear that this would destroy the position of CUNY in recruiting faculty. And in April of 1974, the board reversed its decision. I think the only time in my memory that the board has ever reversed a decision that it took uh, earlier. Then the fiscal crisis hit. And I could spend the rest of this meeting on that. Uh, there were serious losses, uh, but they would have been incomparably worse had there not been a union. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. We lost free tuition, but we did get TAP, which didn't uh, wasn't the same thing, but it did help many students. Uh, we did lose non-tenured faculty and staff but not tenured faculty. Very few tenured faculty were lost and those who were were mostly because their departments were closed. This would not have been the case. The chancellor was calling for massive retrenchment of faculty. Dismemberment, there were serious proposals to break up CUNY. My president at City College, Robert Marshak, 
said we should take the four old senior colleges and move them into SUNY, and they would become university centers in SUNY. There was one problem with that. SUNY didn't want us as university centers because they were already having trouble funding the university centers they had. But Marsh Hackwood persisted, and a, uh, a commission that uh, came out of the Sloan Foundation in 1977, the Wessel Commission, actually proposed the same thing moving the four old senior colleges into SUNY. Other colleges were gonna be closed. Hostos, John Jay, and Richmond were gonna be closed permanently. None of that happened. And I have no doubt living through that, that if there had not been a PSC, it all would have happened, just as the uh, administration wanted. And finally, we got state funding for CUNY for the senior colleges, first at 75%, then 100%, and then also significant state funding for the community colleges. That is what resolved the fiscal crisis in CUNY. So it was a profound crisis. And without the PSC, it would have devastated the university. In the 1980s, uh, the financial situation uh, in New York State stabilized in New York City for a brief period, and we were able to make some significant gains. We improved salaries. There were four contracts in that decade, significant improvements in salaries. Um, we were able to get per capita payments to the welfare fund for retirees so that they could enjoy essentially the same benefits as in-service members. That was not true before that. Retiree benefits were just a fraction of in-service benefits. Uh, we had the Women's Coalition, and Lilia will follow me and talk about that, so I won't cover that. But that was a significant victory for women uh, in CUNY. And finally, uh, we uh, had after-retirement benefits for TIAA retirees. Now, I wrote about this in the Turning the Page segment. So if you want to know more about that, look back at that. But that's one of the most significant victories of the union because more and more of the uh, faculty were going into TIAA. And until 1983, they did not have after retirement health benefits. And that was a tough one to win. New York City was dead set against it. In the 1990s, things changed for the worse. Uh, the state under Mario Cuomo, the father, Mario Cuomo, changed the tax structure in 1987. Uh, Cuomo believed uh, that he had to encourage business to move into New York State. So he cut the uh, tax structure, which starved public services not only CUNY, but SUNY and many, many other uh, services that were supported by the state. But CUNY suffered grievously during that period. They're uh, so bad that the Board of Trustees, uh, CUNY Board of, of Trustees, uh, called for fiscal uh, uh, financial exigency three times, and that allowed them to break tenure and fire faculty and different colleges had uh, elaborate plans for how this would be done. I remember at City College, we went through the whole thing, but we didn't fire anybody. And that was because of the union again. The union um, got the state legislature to put money back that the governor had cut out. This had happened before. It happened uh, in the early 1980s, but it happened again in the 1990s. Several times the legislature and the city council in New York City overrode the mayor or the governor and put money back. We uh, campaigned widely to get public support for the university, which is why these legislators did what they did. There was also an early retirement structure. 617 senior people retired in the 1990s. Now that's an enormous saving to CUNY because of obviously they the most highly paid 
uh, members of the faculty. The plan was that they would be replaced by other full-time faculty, obviously at lower rank, but by other full-time faculty and staff. It didn't happen. Instead, CUNY went to adjuncts, underpaid, exploited adjuncts, and replaced them that way. And uh, this has continued right up to the present. The use of adjuncts to replace full-time faculty in order to save money. Two minutes, Erwin. Thank you, Bonnie. And finally, let me just mention the change of leadership. This also was a characteristic of the 1990s. Uh, after uh, Is Kugler's caucus disbanded, uh, there was no serious challenge to the leadership until the 1990s. The new caucus came in, they won significant victories in college, uh, senior college chapters, mostly big ones. And uh, when Erwin Polishuk retired in, in uh, 2000, the new caucus won the general PSC election of that year decisively and also carried the executive council and the delegate assembly. And that of course brings us to the next 25 years and other people here, including Barbara uh, Bowen and uh, uh, James Davis, We'll be able to talk about that. So thank you very much for reliving the first 25 years with me. Thank you so much, Erwin. Um, Erwin is a real uh, treasure uh, to the PSC, the AAUP, and so many other organizations that he is still active in. Um, okay, well, uh, let's hear now from a very well-known uh, person. Uh, in 1972, Lilia Milani of Brooklyn College led a historic lawsuit on behalf of the women in our union. And we're very fortunate to have her here today. And uh, I would like to ask her to say a few words. Lilia? Hi, wait, Hi. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, what I wanna say is that even though the class action suit has my name as the lead name plaintiff, there were dozens, even hundreds of us working together. And it was all of us working together that made the class action suit successful. And many of the people who were as active as I was are in the audience today, in the retirees chapter. And what I'd like to talk about is the class action suit itself briefly, and then its relationship to the union. Um, are at the time, in, nine, in the nine, early 1970s, it was the largest class action brought by women against a university, the largest in the number of causes of action or charges, there were 15, the size of the class, around 5,000 women, and it was one of the largest university systems in the country, right up there with SUNY California State and the University of California. Uh, the purpose, the obvious purpose, the one that everyone can see is that we were seeking remedy for women who were being discriminated against, were still being discriminated against to prevent further discrimination. But there was also a second subversive purpose, which was to transform the power structure in CUNY so that women had equal access and participation. And we, as soon as we filed our suit, or very shortly thereafter, we got our wish, the first vice chancellor, who was a woman for legal affairs, and she was hired to fight us in court. Because what you wanted to avoid was a male lawyer standing up against the female who were all saying we've been discriminated against. So they now had a woman vice chancellor who of course in her mind was she was hired for her merit. It had nothing to do with us. It was just coincidental that these happened at the same time. Uh, we filed the suit in federal court after much legal uh, efforts at a lower level. 
December 23rd, 1973, and the two major charges were Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Until then, it was legal to discriminate against women. And also another act that was passed after the Civil War to protect freed slaves. And that is uh, Section 1983 of the US Code. Originally, there were 23 named plaintiffs. One died along the way. Some dropped out. Seven more were added. So that at the end, it was still 23, just not the same 23. The CUNY Women's Coalition was an organ was a um, a woman's organization that we founded in December 1971 with Renata Bridenthal, also from Brooklyn College. Uh, the CUNY Women's Coalition and one of the functions, the major function of the CUNY Women's <clears throat> Coalition was to organize the class action suit, to fundraise for it, and to keep women in the university informed. We communicated with the, the class. Uh, the causes of action, the major ones, salary, appointment, reappointment, promotion, tenure, health benefits, maternity policy. This was a time when if a woman got pregnant, she was immediately to tell her president and go on forced maternity leave. If she was untenured when she came back, she started the NOVA. And one, um, my office mate, Kay Rogers, had the fortune, misfortune, to have three pregnancies when she was about to get tenure. So that it took her something like 11 years at a time when you could do it in four to get uh, tenured. And she wrote a book called Misogyny in Literature on her forced maternity breaks. Um, there the, a makeup of committees. We were very fortunate in the judge we got. We got Judge Gagliardi and CUNY wanted him to um, rule on in each cause separately so that the university could go to court, could appeal each cause separately. And he said, oh no, we're doing the whole case and you can't appeal anything until every cause of action has been adjudicated. And of course, in a class action suit, the individual named plaintiff has her case heard individually. She may win or lose, and the class can still be heard. Now, one of the things um, that happened with that is the first cause of action he shrewdly heard was salary, because we know that money is all important, and the women won that. But once you win salary, when women have been discriminated against in salary, that has to come from somewhere. Where would it come from? Initial appointment, reappointment, promotions, tenure. So we were gonna win at least most, if not all of those. So the university settled in 1984. And um, every woman in CUNY, depending on how many, depending on the number of years she had been in the university since 1972, got a certain amount of money for each year. So every woman, full-time woman in CUNY benefited. Then there were procedures set up with a special master to hear individual cases. And the largest group, as I remember it, it's a long time ago now, and uh, all of my records are in the archives at Brooklyn College, which are closed because of COVID. So I couldn't consult them. Um, was the promotion of women who were stuck at the associate level who became full professors. There was a large influx of promotions from that between those two ranks. Then there were, was a special master who heard individual cases. And many women had their salaries equal, uh, equalized, got promotions, got tenure, uh, got made whole. 
Um, and that's as much as I'm going to say about the class action suit. The relationship of the class action suit and the CUNY Women's Coalition to the union initially, there was no connection formally um, because I knew that many of the men who were officers in the UFCT, the LC, and then the PSC were the same people who at their colleges were discriminating against women. Two minutes. And I more. want to read. Um, two minutes more. Did someone say something? Yes, you have two minutes more. Okay, I'm going to read this evaluation with no names uh, of a young woman. Miss H is a pleasure to the eye. And Professor E and I are engaged in molding her into an equal pleasure and boon to the annals of American feminine teaching skill. We huff and puff and we tilt at each other as we discuss the best possible teaching methods. But in the end, we shall overcome women's lit. So I was not having women under the control of males like this in the PSC. However, the unions were very important in our class action suit. I, as a grievance counselor, chapter chairperson, ended up at a delegate, new people, male and female throughout CUNY. I knew how the system worked. I knew the bylaws, I knew the contracts. Um, and when we formed the CUNY Women's Coalition, many of the women who came there were also grievance counselors, had, all, had individual cases and knew how the system really worked and how unjust it was. So we worked together uh, and the UFCT and the LC uh, had a discrimination clause, which was not very effective, the LC didn't. And what the UFCT taught me was you only have as many rights as you can defend and that women had to defend themselves. And I also found our attorney, Judith P. Vladek, who represented um, the UFCT and the PC. Uh, without that, there would have been, this class action would not have existed. And both Bell Zeller and Is Kugler made statements of support for the class action suit at our press conference. And my last point involves Erwin Polishuk. Uh, we were running out of money. Uh, to be blunt, the faculty uh, in CUNY is none too generous with money. We owed our statistician who was threatening to pull out and the case would collapse. Erwin Polishuk for the PSC lent us $5,000. We repaid it later, but he saved the class action suit. And I also know that he was working behind the scenes in his quiet diplomatic way, supporting us. Um, so that's my statement and I apologize if I ran over my 10 minutes. Thank you so much, Lilia. Um, I, as a beneficiary of the gains from that lawsuit, um, I am just particularly grateful to you and all the women. I know Renata's on here and there are so many other people I probably don't know um, who brought this historic lawsuit and thank you so much for telling us about it today. Uh, it's, it's appropriate to uh, introduce the next speaker, uh, uh, an incredible female union leader, Barbara Bowen. Uh, Barbara Bowen is an extraordinary thinker and she was an extraordinary president for 21 years. Um, she's going to focus on some of the highlights of her tenure from 2000 to 2021, and I'll just 
you know, I, I, I think we also have to thank Barbara because although she's uh, no longer the president of the PSC and she's on sabbatical, she continues to play a very important role in our struggle around the healthcare and particularly our Medicare Advantage Plus fight. And we are so appreciative of that. Barbara, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. It's so great to see everyone here uh, and wonderful to have heard that history. I mean, there's so much to say and I can imagine all of us bursting and some people saying in the chat, seeing the continuities uh, between that uh, attack that Erwin described on CUNY from the start and uh, that incredible and appalling evaluation um, that Lilia read. I mean, there's a lot for all of us to say together. Um, also, it was wonderful to be able to honor Bill three time. We were all so lucky that Bill with his whole rich political formation and commitment, that Bill was the retiree chapter chair at this critical moment. Um, and congratulations to the new chapter leadership and together, uh, Anne Friedman, together with Bonnie Nelson, Diane Mena, who are working hard with her, a formidable team, and we have a real powerhouse tradition in the chapter. Um, if you notice the quilt behind me, um, that is also a project initiated by a retiree, Marsha Newfield, thank you. Marsha led PSC members and staff in donating lots of old PSC t-shirts, getting them stitched together, and that's what you see. Um, I also want to thank and congratulate the PSC's 50-year member honorees. Your presence today says much of, I think, what needs to be said about the union's continuity. Workers' organizations have been under immense pressure in this country and continue to be, and they are precious. Counter-hegemonic organizations are precious, and they're precious in part because they fight for the right to time outside of work. So for all retirees, I say retirement itself is an act of solidarity between generations. By enjoying your retirement, you are reinforcing the radical premise that working people are entitled to a life outside of work, a life that gives us a chance to make contributions that go beyond and maybe against wage labor. So it's one reason to celebrate all of us and celebrate the PSC. There might be many ways uh, to recount the history of the PSC and we've had a really good start on it today. And of course we can't do justice to what is necessarily a collective story. Um, and everyone has emphasized that today. Uh, one way to tell the story would be as a chronology. And I think that could be important. Um, but I also, and I, you know, the chronology would also show what Irwin started us on a kind of a battle against unremitting austerity, systemic racism, and a battle that this union has fought with imagination and heart. I love to tell that story, but instead I want to try to work toward a political history of the union in the decades um, where I was president and, in, and to base that history on a series of conceptual moves or political premises that underlay our work. And Samantha's, I think, gonna show some slides. I'm not gonna narrate what's going on in all the slides. You will probably recognize a lot of them. I think the key moves, uh, conceptual moves for us were two. One was believing that unions could be a force for fundamental economic and political change. And two, believing that CUNY at its best could counteract the oppressive educational apparatus in this country that is designed to fail many of the students we teach. If we have time, I'd like to come back to the question of whether CUNY is or ever could be the people's university, as many of us like to call it. But thousands of us were drawn to CUNY and stayed at CUNY because of its singular history in mass higher education and its importance in anti-racist struggle. What made it possible, I think, for the PSC to take risks and break new ground politically in the past two decades was that bedrock of shared commitment. The leaders of the new caucus, many of whom are here today, almost without exception, had deep political histories in left movements, civil rights, labor, anti-war, feminism, gay liberation, community organizing, and more. Those political and intellectual commitments were at the heart of our analysis of CUNY, of the political situation we were in and at the heart of what they were, we were able to do. But they wouldn't have enabled the union as a whole to move forward and enabled people to come together. That's the astonishing thing about what happened in the PSC. It, they, that wouldn't have happened if those commitments hadn't been shared and part of a common history at CUNY and to a certain extent in New York City. So the PSC's political history is among other things, 
a chronicle of shared political hope and the exhilaration of working collectively in service of the working class. A full political history would have to account for the power marshaled against us um, in this very bleak period of racial capitalism, but I don't have time to do that today. That um, atmosphere of austerity, neoliberal austerity of concentration of wealth among the few and deprivation of public institutions was the world we lived in. It dominated the workplace, the funding of CUNY, and I would say the curriculum. But I want to point to a couple of um, premises that I think help to tie together and explain what those 21 years were about. Um, the first sounds very simple. First is act like a union and understand the role of unions as advancing the interests of the whole working class. Second part, not so simple. An essential political move the PSC made was to define the role of the union as advancing, advancing the interests of its members, but also of all workers. And crucially, to see that those two sets of interests were allied, not competing. Decades of right-wing attack on unions through legislation and the courts, together with the purges of the left from the union, helped to unions in general, helped to cultivate a prevailing attitude that each, each union must look out for its own narrow economic interest of its own, of its own members, regardless of whether those interests might conflict with the interests of other workers. The PSC took a radically different position. We believed that the labor movement should be a movement to advance the interests These of These are all your politics and you're a Johnny come uh, And in doing so, to advance our own members and making us stronger. It was because of this shift that the PSC was able to draw on the support of hotel workers and transit workers and nurses at our rallies that we adamantly opposed increasing CUNY's tuition, the CUNY tuition for students, even when doing so would have relieved enormous budget pressure and brought us back pay. It was because of this position that we took strong and early positions to support undocumented immigrants, joining their hunger strikes, fighting for their right to in-state tuition, that we challenged our national union leadership and almost all of organized labor in opposing the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and above all, that we saw opposing racism as a bedrock union activity. Our record is far from perfect and it's very vivid to me how much we were not able to do, but much of the PSC's activity and power came from reconceptualizing the role of a union and finding that in that concept of vastly enlarged power. If there were more time, I'd talk about our struggle over whether we would rename the PSC when we came to office in 2000 and put the name, the word union in our name. I'm sorry that we didn't, but that's the subject for another day. The second premise I would bring up is that the members, all the members are the union and that the broad representation within the PSC is a source of strength. Again, this might sound like a truism, but it really isn't. In the years since 2000, the PSC became an organizing union. We've become a union and I've seen this continue so beautifully this year and expand. We've become a union that can turn out a thousand people to march over the Brooklyn Bridge, that can turn out 3000 largely full-timers to campaign and rally for adjunct health insurance, that can hold a university-wide teach-in, teach CUNY as we did in 2002, can get a 92% yes vote on strike authorization as we did in 2016, can get 5,000 signatures in a week on a petition about curriculum as we did about pathways, can develop vibrant active chapters strong enough to protect their members' lives literally during the pandemic. I really would say our chapter chairs protected lives and a union that can be trusted by more than hundred members in a single year to risk arrest in civil disobedience. And finally, a union that can engage hundreds and hundreds of members in the absolutely essential, but sometimes unseen work of one-on-one -on -one organizing. We made, the members are the union. Uh, that is our bedrock principle and it's been expressed and empowering. In a hierarchical workplace like academia, the union should be a space to break down hierarchies. And I think one of the important things that uh, emerged that we struggled with and emerged and not perfectly is to embrace the range of positions we represent in the PSC. 
full-time and part-time, staff and faculty, adjuncts, CLTs, POs, research associates, full-time professors, research assistants, the whole range to see that as a strength um, and to build on that. And just to give you one brief illustration of that, um, I'll recall the time when we were at the bargaining table and some of the people here were right there um, fighting for paid parental leave. And we wanted 15 weeks of paid parental leave for all full-time faculty and staff. We have yet to get it for part-timers, but we struggled and struggled. And finally management said that we could have eight weeks of full-time paid parental leave, but only for the faculty, nothing for the staff. So we took a caucus, we went outside of the room. And meanwhile, we had um, all kinds of members were in that room. They brought their babies. They were nursing in that room. There were little kids sitting on the bargaining table. Um, but we went outside, we took a caucus and we came back and we said, we will not take the eight weeks for full-time faculty. We'll take six weeks, but for everyone. And for as long as we can have it for the staff too. And management was so astonished that we would say, take anything less than they had offered that they said, oh, go ahead, just take the eight weeks for everyone. And that's just one moment of solidarity where the strength of our titles brought us more strength. The third premise I would mention is that the union must tackle the biggest labor crisis in our industry and must see its role as raising the floor. Um, the biggest labor crisis Erwin already mentioned is the opportunistic, cruel, unforgivable, and contemptuous of students' gesture and practice of replacing full-time secure labor with insecure, underpaid, part-time labor. The biggest fights we've had in the PSC have consistently been about that giant fissure going right down the middle of our union and uh, uh, of our whole industry. CUNY is at the far end as an exploiter, but it's throughout the industry. A key move we made was early in our time in office, which was to stop the practice of discouraging adjuncts from joining the union, but in fact, to impose agency fee, collect agency fee from adjuncts and incentivize their joining. The number of adjuncts went up tenfold almost, almost immediately. And that changed our union. It changed our responsibilities and it, it raised the risk of failure. Um, but the key point that if you had more time we could talk about is showing our union, I think we saw this, that the adjunct labor is everyone's issue. The crisis in adjunct labor is everyone's crisis. We all suffer in a material way, in a political way, and in an educational way when any of us are underpaid. And taking that on was a key premise. I'll just mention a few more in the short time we have left. Um, another premise that I think underlay a lot of what we did is the idea that contract negotiations are an arena of struggle to remake the workplace and the university. The hallmark of the PSC's approach to contract negotiations was as a forum through which to change not only the conditions of our work, but the conditions of our students' educations. We approach collective bargaining as our surest methods, the one legal arena two, where they Two minutes, must Barbara. Listen, thanks, Bonnie. And it's the surest method of changing the university itself. If you look at the gains in sabbaticals, in professional development, in junior faculty leave, paid parental leave, you see that theme right through. I'll just finish by mentioning a few others, which I think um, are critically important. Number five for me would be refusing to normalize the defunding of CUNY. That is a key conceptual move. Instead of trying to make the best of it, instead of doing what management has done, which is to pry themselves, even boast about their ability to do more with less, the PSC from the start insisted on naming and refusing to normalize the idea that CUNY should always be poor. We saw that as rooted in racism, in an approach in an oppression of the working class and refused to accept it. Um, and finally, um, I, I will mention um, a sixth principle, I think that underlay a lot of what we did, which was to resist the sorting function of education uh, and rethink education itself. This might be one of the hardest to maintain. Um, I think a lot of our work with our students and uh, against some of the curriculum decisions in the institution were against the notion that part of what education does 
is not just advance people, but it is in fact eject people along the way. And that's why I've often quoted Audre Lorde saying about African-Americans and women, African-American women in this country, we were never meant to survive. I don't think CUNY is the people's university because I don't think its design is to make our students survive and thrive. And we've constantly had to work against that. So uh, I'd love to explore more, but I'll just finish by saying that um, W.E.B. Du Bois in his book, Black Reconstruction in America, writes that democracy needs to stay in place long enough to allow a new political formation to take hold, one in which the workers are in power. We might say the same about unions on this occasion of the PSE's 50th anniversary. Unions must stay alive and stay strong in part because of what they accomplish and especially unions powered by an oppositional political analysis because of what they accomplish in the present, but also because of what they can prepare for and prefigure for the future. I see it as a responsibility of the PSC to sustain and fight for and change our unions and to prefigure a different organization of power and of our lives. So happy birthday, PSC. So proud to be a part of it. Thank you. And you're muted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, thank you, Barbara. Uh, though younger than me, uh, Barbara has always been a real role model for me as a, a strong woman leader. And um, we owe her so, so much. I, I, I was fortunate to be on the executive council for 15 years when Barbara was president. I was in the room <laughs> when she, uh, she described what happened with the parental leave. And that's not the first time that we uh, stood our ground. I believe we also did it for um, adjunct office hours. Uh, and I don't remember the exact story, but at the stroke of midnight, um, we, we held out and um, we, uh, we made a significant gain for our part-time uh, faculty with an office hour win. So um, next is Cecilia McCall. Cecilia was our PSC secretary from 2000 to 2006 and spearheaded our legislative program that's been so integral to our budget and contract struggles. So Cecilia. Okay, I think I'm un unmuted now. Yes. Uh, well, you know what they say about a hard act to follow. Such brilliance. Uh, Barbara Bowen is probably one of the most brilliant people I've ever had an opportunity to work with. It's good to see her and it's wonderful to be with you all on this glorious June morning in celebration of the union's amazing 50 years. But how old does that make us? <laughs> I am grateful to be with so many of my aged colleagues with whom I have been making good trouble for more than 30 years, especially Bill, who deserves a medal for his leadership during the COVID pandemic and the crisis with our health insurance. And our newly elected chairperson, Ann Friedman. She and I have served together on the executive committees of the University Faculty Senate and the Professional Staff Congress and in various capacities with AAUP at the national and state levels. Our chapter is in good hands. A little more than 20 years ago, I was elected, elected secretary of the PSC and like the other officers, Barbara Bowen president, Steve London first vice president and John Hyland treasurer had to learn my job with the added responsibility of coordinating the legislative effort. I don't know how the other three felt, but I knew I was flying by the seat of my pants. Fortunately, one of our first acts was to hire Eileen Moran and Amanda Margulies to assist me. And anyone who has worked with them 
knows just how smart and skillful they are. They, along with Steve London and many of today's chapter meeting, many of those here in today's chapter meeting, formed the core of our first legislation committee. We used funds in the budget, rebated by NYSET to the union from Coke donations, to convene a weekend conference of activists from all of the campuses to jumpstart our agenda, which according to the PSC's constitution, is to make recommendations to the executive council regarding electoral endorsements, political action, and legislation affecting our membership and affiliates. That was no easy feat in the year 2000 when Republicans were a majority in the state Senate and George Pataki was governor. Abetted by his conservative colleagues, Pataki had launched a financial attack against CUNY, cutting its operating budget by 102 million and increasing tuition by $750. New York State, like most states in the country, had adopted austerity budgeting. Rather than increase taxes, the burden of financing the public colleges was shifted to students. Increased tuition and decreased funding have become standard practice in a no-tax neoliberal environment. With our allies, however, we worked to elect progressive politicians, with Democrats now controlling both houses of the state legislature. The current leadership of our committee has organized a CUNY caucus of senators and assembly persons who understand and advocate for the needs of this urban public university. Successive iterations of the committee have built coalitions with students and grassroots organizations so that our rocky beginning has grown to the extent that I believe we are CUNY's major lobbying effort. CUNY has traditionally understated its financial needs, but when we go to work, we tell it like it is and have lobbied for full funding for faculty, staff, and students. And this year, CUNY pretty much adopted a budget with, with good results that paralleled our New Deal for CUNY bill. You may or may not recall that when we came into office, not only was Pataki governor, but Rudolph Giuliani was mayor. His ideological attacks against CUNY, his demeaning of our diverse student body, and his ending of open admissions and remediation at the senior colleges had motivated us to run for union office. We intended to use the union's resources and might to defend the university against conservative, racist politicians like Giuliani, one of whose campaign acts on the road to the mayor's office was to participate in a police organized riot and the storming of City Hall after David Denkins dared announce the formation of a civilian complaint review board. In spite of the mayor, we were able to gain influence with the city council, which had adopted term limits. The old guards leaving gave us an opportunity to cultivate the young grassroots activists coming into city government. We organized a Teach, teach CUNY, which we called CUNY 101, so that they would know about us and the university, and they came. This kind of outreach to current and potential council members is ongoing and an inter integral component of the committee's role. Though we confronted and struggled against the indifference, if not hostility of conservative politicians toward our public university, for the most part, Giuliani accepted, they were not the ilk of today's GOP. At this moment, we are facing challenges that none of us old timers could have predicted or imagined. While a progressive state and city legislators are proposing and enacting social and economic reforms, hate, racism, and white supremacy are in ascendance all over this country. 
Schools are no longer safe places for youngsters. Black and brown people are under assault. The rights of women, immigrants, and the LGBT community are being attacked. And the integrity of our electoral and ju judicial systems is being undermined. The people who challenge civil rights are the same as those who lie about climate change and believe a million dead Americans is not too high a price to pay for their freedom not to be vaccinated, not to wear masks, and not to take any precautions proposed by government. All of this is occurring on our watch. So we cannot pat ourselves on the back and be smug about local victories while we bequeath to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren a planet not fit to live on, a country not fit to live in, and one that we will not have to live in. And how do we respond when they look us in the eye and ask, Grandma, Grandpa, how could you let this happen? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Cecilia. Uh, beautiful and so moving. Well, we're now going to turn to Bill again, and Bill is going to uh, take us through a visual retrospective of 50 years with uh, the slideshow that he and um, some others have put together. So Bill, you're up, and I guess Samantha also uh, is helping with the slideshow. Uh can people see the slides that I put up? Yes. All right, so let me start by thanking Erwin, Lilia, Barbara, Cecilia for their presentations and for providing rich context um, for the slideshow that I'm going to show you. Um, this is a retrospective of the PSC 1972 to 2022. It's not a historical analysis but rather it's going to be a blur of images and a memorable moments organized chronologically. Uh, nonetheless, there's an important historical backdrop to what I'm about to show you. Uh, open admissions uh, was established at the City University, what, just two years before the PSC was founded. And this is a picture uh, of students taking over the South Campus of CCNY in 1969. Uh, which really started the open admission struggle. Uh, CUNY has always served the children of the whole people, as Horace Webster put it in 1847. Horace Webster was a founder of the Free Academy, which was the precursor of CCNY and the precursor of CUNY. Um, CUNY has always served working people, the working class, the working poor, immigrants. Um, but what changed after open admissions he reflected the change in the demographics of New York. And more and more CUNY represented, uh, uh, students represented people of color, um, which I think explains the link, which I'll get to in a minute, in which Barbara talked about at great length uh, between racism and austerity. Uh, another historical backdrop uh, was the Taylor Law. Um, this is a picture of the famous TWU strike in 1966. Um, shortly after that, New York State passed the Taylor Law, which guaranteed the right of public sector workers to bargain collectively, but, and this is a really important but, outlawed strikes took away labor's most powerful tool uh, when it's negotiating uh, for contracts. Uh, I'll allude to this as I go through this slideshow. And then of course, um, what, what uh, Erwin, Barbara, and Cecilia talked about was austerity. Uh, I, I think that as Barbara put it, you know, what CUNY has done is normalized the defunding of, of, of the university. Um, and that austerity I think is tied, you know, to the changing nature of our student body. I think it's tied to issues of race um, as certainly Barbara, Cecilia, and Erwin have gone into. Uh, whoops. Uh, 
Oh, and, and then the other historical backdrop uh, is two existential moments. Irwin talked about one of them. Um, Barbara talked about, I, I think, both of them. Um, the 1970s fiscal crisis, um, and of course, uh, an existential moment today, the pandemic starting in 20, uh, 2020. I mean, both these crises really threatened, I think, the existence of CUNY, of what CUNY was going to look like in the future. Uh, and that will be reflected in this slideshow. Uh, and then finally, the other historical backdrop, which certainly Barbara uh, emphasized uh, in great detail, the adjunctification of higher education. Um, certainly not something that CUNY has escaped. Um, the question here, does CUNY run on adjunct labor? Uh, unfortunately, you better believe it. Uh, we now have 4,000 fewer full-time faculty than we did when most of us started at the university and when the university had a much <clears throat> smaller student body. And of course, the number of adjuncts at CUNY in the last 50 years has not only increased by the hundreds, but by the thousands and thousands and thousands. Um, and as Barbara noted, um, that's an issue that really involves all of us and affects all of us. Uh, it affects most obviously the adjuncts uh, who go from pillar to post and are super exploited. It certainly it affects the full-time faculty and obviously dramatically affects our students. So organizing this chronologically, I mean, um, as Erwin pointed out, you know, the two founding leaders of the, of the PSC were Bell Zeller and Is Kugler, uh, pictured here, who in 2012, you know, uh, were added to the pillars of labor at uh, NYU's uh, Tamament, you know, labor, labor library. Um, here's a rather crude uh, line drawing. I think uh, PSC art has gotten better since 1972, commemorating uh, the union of the UFCT and the LC. Uh, in, in 1972. This is, I think, an iconic image, um, uh, contract mobilization. Uh, this was a meeting in, what, 1972, 1973, uh, at the old Mark Ballroom uh, off Union Square. I was there, probably many of this meeting were there, um, and it was not only a rally to organize around contract mobilization, but a strike vote was taken there, an overwhelming strike vote. Um, obviously, we did not strike, but the PSC set up picket lines uh, at uh, many CUNY colleges, organizing members and building alliances with students. Whoops, my slideshow all of a sudden got stuck here. Bear with me for a second. Sorry about this, but I don't know why all of a sudden I can't advance my slides. Um, Samantha, can you help with that? Um, Bill, sometimes if you click back into the slideshow, you should be able to do it. Click what? If, if you... Okay, yeah, yeah that, that, in, that yeah. seems to do it, okay. Yeah. So contract mobilization and in all these pictures, uh, you, you notice that the men are in tie and jackets, the, the women are formally dressed, except this picture, which of course includes students. They're the only ones wearing slacks and more casual clothes, more of the look of demonstrations today. Um, so, and then, then this last picture of the initial contract mobilization picketers confronting then mayor John Lindsay. Uh, as Erwin pointed out, the then chancellor Kibbe uh, and the board imposed or tried to impose tenure quotas. They actually did, the board approved it, a 50% tenure quota. The PSC immediately mobilized, um, reached out to its allies among the students, among organized labor. Uh, and within a year, as Erwin pointed out, um, that policy was reversed. Uh, 
I talked to two existential crises, one that most people in this room, at least of those of us who are 50 year members went through the fiscal crisis of the 1970s. And of course on the right uh, is the iconic headline from the daily news, Ford to city drop dead. I mean, labor played a role that historians are still arguing about, um, but in important ways, I mean, as Erwin pointed out, um, Obviously, while there were losses, the, the, the PSC, you know, uh, really intervened in ways th that I think saved our bacon. Um, I mean, and then most important in that intervention was people on the campuses organizing. One of the colleges threatened with closure was Ostos Community College, um, where there was a strong faculty, staff, student and community coalition built. Uh, and as we know, Ostos survived. Um, Erwin Polishuk and others, you know, uh, entered into negotiations with the state. Um, Erwin went into more detail about this. Eventually more funds were secured, but all of us who were working at the time know that we lost two or three weeks of pay. We were eventually paid back with interest. Um, in 76, th there was a heavily and bitterly contested election, as Erwin pointed out. Um, Erwin Polishuk beat Israel Kugler. Um, picture of uh, Erwin and Bell Zeller as Bell Zeller passes the torch. Chapter chairs, you know, have been meeting monthly really since the 70s. Um, the PSC from the get go was part of an important uh, labor federation. The New York State United Teachers, made up mainly of K through 12 teachers, but of course, um, the PSC played an important role of getting NYSE to put higher education on its agenda. Uh, the, the 80s, I'm not going to show you picture after picture of contract negotiations, but I just show this picture because right there in the center is Arnold Cantor, who was the longtime executive director of the PSC. Um, uh, the Milani case, uh, of course, really gave us a really terrific presentation. Uh, and we talked about that earlier and uh, of its great, great importance. The PSE playing a kind of mixed role in that, but nonetheless, at the end, uh, financially, an important role. Um, PSC has always organized in solidarity to support other unions, you know, which we've certainly done over the years. And of course, other unions have come to our support. Next, kind of a blur of, of faces, uh, you know, over the years, uh, you know, second from the right here is a very young John Hyland, uh, Erwin Polishuk with Betty Shabazz, who taught at uh, Medgar Evers College. And of course, Betty Shabazz was the wife of the late uh, Malcolm X. Uh, two uh, members of the staff who I think Many of us certainly remember Clarissa Weiss and Diana Rosado. Probably many of us at this meeting were advised on our retirement by Clarissa. Um, more faces. There's Greg Wist on the right. Uh, actually, I had lunch with Greg about two years ago, and he looks just as young today as he did in his <laughs> picture 40 or 50 years ago. Um, more pictures. As I said, kind of a blur of pictures. Uh, Erwin Yellowitz talked about uh, in uh, turning the page and when he made his presentation uh, a little while ago about the role that uh, Erwin Polishuk played behind the scene in terms of linking you know, membership in TIA to city health insurance. The 90s, um, Erwin also, I think, put this pretty dramatically. Uh, Papa Cuomo uh, and George Pataki um, uh, introducing uh, basically a new tax code and austerity budgets. Interesting in this photo is uh, second from the right uh, is Sandy Cooper. Uh, I know Sandy's a 50 year member and uh, hopefully here today, arm in arm with Erwin Polishup um, uh, and Ed Sullivan, who was then an important ally of the PSC and uh, chair of the state Senate Committee on Higher Education. Um, to nullify retrenchments, the PSC went to court. The PSC actually won initially. Uh, CUNY uh, appealed, 
uh, won on an appeal, but then entered into a settlement agreement. There were losses then, uh, but clearly without the PSC, those losses would have been much greater. Uh, not a very good picture, but I just want to note that on the left is Ann Friedman, um, who together with Lorraine Cohn all the way on the right, uh, organized the first CUNY-wide community college conference. Uh, and of course, Ann subsequently became vice president for community colleges. Uh, she served several terms and of course is now our new retiree chair. CLTs have already played or always played an important role in our union. And on the right is Bob Worman, um, who played an important role in our retiree chapter. More pictures. Uh, there's a young Al Bachman, a young, younger John Hyland, uh, others, very sullen me on the upper left. Um, and then who are these two women on the lower right? Uh, second from the right at the bottom, looks like a teenage Joan Greenbaum. Um, and then Barbara Bowen, whatever happened to her? Uh, so then going to the years 2000 to 2020, Erwin uh, Polishuk stepped down at the beginning of the year 2000 and Richard Boris for a couple months became the acting president of the PSC. Oh, that's what happened to Barbara Bowen. Uh, the new caucus won a pretty resounding victory in the April 2000 election. Um, in the last 20 years, I mean, we've gone through a number of crises, both internal and some external, um, and certainly 9-11 BMCC was directly affected uh, when World Trade numbers Trade Center number seven fell on Fitterman Hall, which was part of BMCC, basically destroyed the building. Um, BMCC went through some tough years, and of course, had tremendous support from the Central Union. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Jonathan Buxbaum, now an esteemed new member of our retiree chapter, organized Labor Goes to the Movies. Um, Barbara, I think, it, in her presentation also so showed you know, postcards being stacked up uh, on the steps of the state capitol. Um, uh, obviously, since its inception, the PSC has been doing organizing around state budgets and around city budgets. Uh, some of it very creative, very important street theater, hundreds of thousands of postcards stacked up, you know, postcards from students, faculty, staff, um, community calling for an increase in the student budget, uh, in the CUNY budget. Uh, EOCs, Educational Opportunity Centers, uh, have also been represented by the PSC and EOC faculty and staff have made important gains under the PSC contract and they played an important role in our union. And of course, one of our principal officers, our treasurer is currently Felicia Wharton, uh, shown uh, at the upper right. As Barbara noted, um, the PSC took stands, certainly on the uh, Iraq and Af Afghanistan wars, um, obviously in opposition. This is a famous demonstration in 2002, which was worldwide. I think six million people participated, including several hundred from the PSC. Uh, at uh, our affiliates, the AFT and NYSET, we brought uh, resolutions uh, calling on labor to oppose the war in 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005. Uh, we lost the vote on all those resolutions, if I remember correctly, but got closer and closer each time. And then finally at the AFT convention in Boston in 2006, we prevailed and I think had not only an impact on uh, the AFT, but all of organized labor in terms of taking a stand against the war. Uh, we've marched in Labor Day parades, um, uh, here's an example of the Municipal Labor Council participating in a very positive way on a healthcare issue, a PICA program covering high cost drugs. Of course, uh, we have some questions about how the MLC behaved in our Medicare Advantage uh, versus traditional Medicare you know, crisis. Um, and of course, here are John Hyland and Cecilia McCall uh, feeling 
with smiles on their faces as they're retiring as principal officers, but not as activists. Um, in, John was treasurer and Cecilia, of course, was secretary of the union. Grievance counselors, you know, I can show hundreds and hundreds of photos, which I'm not going to do, of grievance counselors drawn from the membership, you know, uh, who have done important work over the years. Um, uh, a professional development fund uh, set up uh, many de decades ago uh, for heroes, one subsequently for adjuncts, um, for, for research. Um, an important victory, uh, overtime victory uh, for HEOs won at LaGuardia in, in 2007. Um, PSC has continued to do solidarity work, not only here in the city, but nationally sending out, down um, a fairly large team of people to New Orleans um, uh, after, in the wake of Katrina. This campaign of outrage, how cheap can you be? Five colleges shortchanging uh, adjuncts and not paying them you know, the full money that they were owed. Uh, uh, creative th street theater confronting these people. And of course, that's uh, Diane Mena on the left, our new vice president uh, or vice chair for the PSC retirees chapter. Um, more contract organizing. And of course, Barbara talked about this, and you know, immediately I, I don't have any pictures of parents uh, nursing babies uh, uh, at contract negotiations. Um, but this was an imp crucially important moment for the PSC uh, in 2008. The 2008 contract, uh, you know, had a landmark provision for paid parental leave, and as Barbara noted. Uh, we stood our ground and made sure that it wasn't just simply for faculty, but included professional staff. Um, picture of a hall of shame uh, in terms of, you know, what's happening to our capital structure. You know, it could show hundreds of pictures like this. Our health and safety uh, uh, advocates, you know, have organized to mitigate this. Um, this is... Uh, Retire, uh, research fund members and supporters picketing in December of 2010 uh, in what was a successful campaign for a decent contract. Uh, people say that this is a great improvement in how I looked. I was dressed as the Grinch. Uh, the PSC <laughs> certainly has in recent years uh, mobilized direct action, civil disobedience, Oh, there's that Barbara Bowen again, you know, being handcuffed. Uh, this is the state capitol. I think I was up there too. Um, the retirees chapter played an important role in creating a safety net committee. And here's one of our retiree activists, still a retiree activist, uh, Evie Rich, speaking at a program. Adjunct healthcare. Let me just take a moment about this. I believe it was in 1985, Erwin Yellowitz will correct me if I'm wrong, that adjunct healthcare was provided to a limited number of adjuncts through the PSC CUNY Welfare Fund. But this was a particularly, you know, with inflation and the incredible escalating costs of healthcare, uh, put a real drag on, on the finances of, of the uh, welfare fund and its ability to continue this. The PSC organized a campaign to get CUNY first to push the state for funding for adjunct health care. Um, the impossible adjunct health care fight. Let me quote from Marsha Newfield uh, on our retiree executive board, former vice president for part-time personnel. And I think in 2012, NICET Higher Education Member of the Year. She said, moving adjunct healthcare insurance to the city plan is a triumph of persistence. For 14 years in the face of the reactions of improbable, impossible, and you must be dreaming, the PSC never gave up because of its commitment to justice. Um, and in 2014, um, adjuncts, not all adjuncts, but those who qualify, were put on the uh, uh, city plan. Uh, 
and this had a profound impact on the welfare fund, um, freeing funds for vision, more funds for vision, hearing, drugs, dental. Um, also, uh, in contract negotiations, we won more funds. You know, a big shout out to the, the president executive director of the welfare fund, Donna Costa. Many of us have gotten to know over this past year, Larry Morgan, the former director, and a particular shout out to Steve London, who was the executive officer of the welfare fund trustees in terms of pushing for more and more benefits. Graduate students as early as 2007, probably before that, were organizing uh, for, for health care benefits, recent side agreements, you know, their benefits have been enhanced. More solidarity, Occupy Wall Street. This is going to be a blur just as I quickly go through this. But as Barbara noted, we can't begin to talk about the role that PSC staff has played. Um, uh, some have recently retired, uh, like Doug Ferrari, Diana Rosado, and Anna Torres here, uh, Deborah Bergen and Barbara Gabriel, um, Faye Aladdin, and Isabel Mercado. I don't have pictures of them, but they recently retired. Our executive director, Debbie Bell, retired. Our deputy executive director, Naomi Zouderer, retired, capably replaced by Dean Hubbard uh, and Anna East Serkin. Uh, Renee Lasher, who used to be head of contract enforcement, also left the union. Uh, Faye Moore is now head of contract enforcement. And of course, Peter Hognes, who what, for 14 or 15 years, edited the Clarion, uh, the Clarion, the winner of just award after award of, after award um, in, in, in labor journalism. Uh, the present editor, Ari Paul and Jamal Ahmad, the associate editor, our crack communications department. I mean, this is actually an old picture, but, but uh, uh, Shamal, uh, Fran Clark, the ubiquitous Fran Clark, the ubiquitous Amanda Malgahase, um, doing stellar, stellar work. As I noted with 9-11, the PSC has weathered, I guess pun intended, a number of crises. Uh, the PSC played an important role after Sandy in not only at affected campuses, but organizing and helping in communities throughout New York City. Sad note, we lost some real stalwarts uh, in the last 10 years. Larry Kaplan, who shaped retiree advocacy for the PSC, um, really turned the retiree chapter into the chapter that it is today and played a crucial role in terms of organizing municipal retirees um, in, in New York City with the founding of the Council of Municipal Retiree Organizations, Comro. Ezra Seltzer, former COT chapter uh, chair, longtime leader in the chapter, uh, played a role in PSC health and safety. Um, a lifetime CUNY person. Uh, he played on the Brooklyn College football team as a halfback, as a star halfback in the 1950s. Not many people know that Brooklyn College had a football team, but they did in the 50s. Uh, Jerry Meyer, I mean, I talked about the struggles at Ostos earlier, recalling the man who saved Ostos, and of course, Erwin Polishev, um, 24 crucially important years for the PSC um, from 76 to 2000, the past in 2019. Um, People's Climate March, September 2014. Um, some 350,000 people marched in New York City, the biggest climate march ever in this city. And here in this picture, I don't know if you can see the red circle here, the PSC by far had the biggest labor contingent, over 500 people in this demonstration. And off of the work that we did organizing for this came the Environmental Justice Committee. Uh, which has been headed by several retirees over the years, including Eileen Moran and presently Nancy Roma. Trump's election, hard, sorry to bring up another dark moment, um, but the PSC took a stand uh, after the election of Trump, stand that had been taken all along, I think, you know, against all forms of hatred, empowering our students with critical thinking skills, um, playing a role in the sanctuary movement and particularly CUNY as a sanctuary. Um, 
and doubling down on anti-racism work. And anti-bullying, um, I think, is really tied to this. The, this is a photo from, I think, 2005, and that's Iris Delutro on the left, then uh, the vice president for uh, cross-campus units in the PSE and still holding that position, um, who has been um, a leader in anti-bullying campaigns, which if you look at it, mainly affect the professional staff at the PSC, um, who are for the most part majority, uh, you know, people of color. And I think there's a relationship between anti-bullying uh, and, and racism. Amy, Amy, Amy Jew leading uh, the current anti-bullying committee, one of the leaders, the late Graciano Matos, you know, who for years and years, you know, talked about a bully-free CUNY and had a vision for it that people are trying to carry out. Um, and certainly the PSC has doubled down on anti-racism work. Uh, there's now uh, a growing anti-racism committee inside the PSC, which is addressing not only hateful incidents like this, but the structural racism um, that impacts uh, CUNY and the PSC. Of course, one of the things that happened in the last few years, what, 2018, is the Janus decision came down, taking away agency fee. But the PSC organized well in advance, prepared for it. Um, and our union membership has been maintained and I think is stronger than ever. And then, saluted staff before, want to salute organizing staff. Um, I mean, it's not the organizers that this that by themselves make things happen, but they help empower member activism. Um, and as Barbara pointed out, certainly in the last 20 years, building up that organizing staff has been crucially important. I noticed that Barbara also included this slide in her presentation, a lead up to a strike authorization vote, 2015 civil disobedience. And of course, you'll notice right there in the center of the front row are two retirees, Jim Perlstein and Steve Lieberstein. Um, Barbara talked about this, the 92% yes vote for strike authorization. We did not go out on strike, but there's no doubt that mobilizing for one um, helped win significant gains. Some of these gains were actually won before this vote. Uh, teaching hours reduced at City Tech, uh, the historic December 2017 agreement, uh, how we won the teaching load reduction, three credit reduction, hour credit, reduction for teaching faculty at senior and community colleges. Important victories on reassigned time, the 80%, you know, full sabbatical, full sabbatical at 80% pay, full pay reassigned time for junior faculty. The fight for adjunct equity. And I put this up here purposely. We called for adjuncts to be paid $7,000 per course. Um, that was aiming high. Uh, and I think it was important to put out that demand. We did not win the 7K, we will win it. We got close to it, um, but it was important to think big. Um, we've won things, important victories for adjuncts over the years, as Barbara pointed out. Um, Multi-year appointments. Uh, the 2017-23 contract essentially won a 71% increase that will be realized by the end of the contract, 71% for adjuncts teaching a three credit course uh, and for a four credit course close to that 7K. Um, the adjunct professional development fund that, that has been developed over the years, but there is so much more, to, so much that has been accomplished. I, I, I can't, begin to tell you how much I need to emphasize what we want. Uh, but the issue of adjunctification, the issue of uh, ag adjunct equity is still very much with us. And there are crucial gains that have to be made and pay. Crucial gains bringing more under the healthcare umbrella, uh, including healthcare for adjuncts uh, when they retire. Crucial gains in terms of uh, job security, some limited job security, very important, you know, with a three-year appointment, but there's so much more to do. Uh, and that's part of this whole fight that Barbara and others uh, emphasize, fighting austerity. Here are some of the officers uh, 
that Cecilia mentioned, including Cecilia, you know, who played an important role uh, in terms of uh, our mobilizations in Albany and at City Hall, and key staff. And of course, a big part of this was building alliances and, and helping to create um, the CUNY Rising Alliance. And here, a big shout out needs to be made to uh, Mike Fabricant, played an important role of this. But CUNY Alliance is a growing, and I mean growing, alliance of students, alumni, community, unions, not just the PSC, that has played an important fight in, in terms of you know, uh, our campaigns in Albany and at City Hall. And of course, it's the CUNY Rising Alliance with the PSC that has developed a vision, a frame for our organizing, the New Deal for CUNY, increase the ratio of full-time faculty to students and professionalize adjunct compensation. Second key demand, reset the ratios of mental health counselors and academic advisors to students in line with national standards. And the third, and this is really important, make CUNY once again tuition free. Um, there's been buy-in to the New Deal for CUNY. Uh, this is a four or five year plan. Legislation that has been crafted. Um, here's Senator Gennard is speaking at, at a rally. Uh, and of course, a lot of the most important work on the New Deal community has been done during these pandemic years, um, where the PSC basically had to develop a campaign to save lives, save jobs, save CUNY. Um, at Hunter High School, in where, what was it, two years ago, um, faculty there voted to strike, if necessary, uh, against the Taylor Law uh, if certain safety precautions were not enacted and inspections made at, at uh, Hunter College High School. Um, and here's a rally outside Hunter College High School how can I teach science at a school that won't use science? Um, but we won um, there. The PSC came up with creative ways of organizing at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when basically we couldn't do face-to-face -face organizing, or it was dangerous to do it. Car and bike caravans. Um, Once we started doing more face-to-face -face, you know, rallies, uh, including this more recent one at CUNY headquarters. And of course, a crucial role played during the pandemic with health and safety as, as an issue was played by the health and safety watchdogs. Uh, Gene Grassman on the left, you know, has been one of the heads of this committee for many years. This year became, was selected as nice at higher education member of the year. And of course, lots of retirees, Joan Greenbaum on the right, Dave Kotochuk, Jackie Elliott, and of course, whoops, I think I left an L out of Jackie's name here. Oh, no, no, there it is. Um, during the pandemic, uh, the people who've been hardest hit have been adjuncts uh, with as uh, Barbara noting, um, it was mainly adjunct jobs that were hit during this period. But the PSC uh, has moved aggressively against this and has won some important grievances, particularly at Medgar Evers and Bronx Community College, you know, restoring people's um, jobs. I just want to note, as Anne noted at the beginning of the day, um, that what we have an honor roll of 142 50 year members. I'm sure there are many more. Um, maybe the Otis is George Crouch, former chair of the PSC CLT chapter. Uh, and here's a picture of him for, uh, circa World War II, which was actually taken from an article in the New York Times uh, two years ago, uh, focusing on George and kind of a heroic recovery um, from a really uh, serious case of, of COVID. Hopefully George is here today and can join us at the open mic. And then finally, stop the privatization of our Medicare. I mean, obviously during this pandemic, um, PSC retirees uh, have been consumed with this issue. Uh, uh, 
we've discussed it, we've talked about it, we organized, uh, and here's a demonstration on the hottest day of the year. I believe this was a year ago uh, in June of 2021. Um, that's Eileen Moran on the left who actually spoke at this demonstration, you know, held together with other municipal retirees. That fight will continue. So in some, uh, I'm finally getting to the end. I mean, this has been a blur of images and memorable moments about a union that I think is characterized by democracy and act activism. Democracy can be very messy. There's certainly been contested elections, you know, that we talked about in 76 and 2000. Um, there's certainly been controversy over resolutions. Certainly we know that in, in, in the last year. Um, there's certainly been tension around adjunct organizing. Um, but I think the amazing thing is our ability uh, to join together, to build solidarity, um, that this is a union of activists. Uh, and I'm gonna end with an image. Well, actually it's the, one more image after this, but that Barbara alluded to earlier, over a thousand people back in March, marching across the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, a powerful rally uh, of faculty, students, not only from CUNY, but from SUNY, um, community groups. And I think this is the symbol of solidarity that we're moving forward with. Uh, we have the frame of the new deal for CUNY in terms of our budget and contract fights. Uh, I think brighter days are ahead of us. And in terms of moving forward and discussing the challenges, let me segue uh, to our president, James Davis, who Anne will now introduce. And I'm going to stop this screen share. Bill, thank you so much. That was fabulous beyond words. And um, we'll have to use it over and over and uh, codify it and, you know, make it available to as many people as possible. And I think, you know, one thing that we might do moving forward uh, is think about a labor education arm in, in our union. We, that's one of the things I think uh, we talked about. I know Stanley Aronowitz, who's not with us, anymore either and Nancy and Mike and I had talked about that way, way, way back. And uh, I, I, I think that I'm certainly reminded of history that I participated in but forgot. And of course, history that way, way predates me. And it's so important that we uh, understand that and remind ourselves of that. So. Now we're in the present and uh, courageous, talented, and really, really smart. D James Davis, uh, our cu current pre PSC president, began his tenure in the midst of the COVID crisis and with great patience and grace and humor. I think James has been in office just about a year uh, in June, and James is going to talk to us about what he sees the PSC looking like today and visions for the future. James. Thanks, Anne. Um, thank you for having me. It's really an honor, and, and it's a huge privilege to be able to join you all. And I'm going to be very brief because I know that the, um, the auspicious occasion today really is uh, also to celebrate the 50 year members. So I wanna make sure we have time to recognize the 50 year members. 50 years is a pretty incredible thing. And that slideshow bill that you just did, I mean, what a testament to just the rich history, the durability. I mean, the durability of the union that you all have helped to build. Um, that slideshow and Bill really beautifully narrated, thank you. So I do wanna um, extend a special thanks to, to Bill and a congratulations, and it turns out a happy birthday as well, who just has offered so much to all of us and especially to the Rotary's chapter. Um, it's really been wonderful to work with you, Bill, and I wanna thank Anne also for um, retiring from retirement to become a chapter chair. It's a courageous thing you're doing, Anne, and I 
have always loved working with you and it's going to be great that you're continuing. And I know you'll be um, joined also by um, Diane and others who are, are going to help out. So really thanks. And, and I also want to say what an honor it really is to share some space on the agenda with Erwin and Barbara, um, Cecilia, really extraordinary PSC leaders, exceptionally talented individuals with such an enduring commitment to this organization. Um, you know, and Barbara has been an inspiration and a mentor to me from before I took office and since I took office, and I'm really grateful for that. And I just want to say Lilia and I overlapped um, for many years in the Brooklyn College English Department, which I joined in 2003 when I started my career at CUNY. And, you know, Lilia, I was realizing that when I started in that department, the senior leadership of the department was all women, the department chair the deputy department chair, the undergraduate deputy, the graduate deputy, all women. So, you know, that lawsuit, Lilia, that you are the lead plaintiff on clearly helped to bring more women into academic leadership positions and, and um, ensure that they would be uh, equitably compensated. So I'm gonna keep my remarks very brief and just gesture um, to the future a little bit. So, you know, I, I first got involved in PSC activism when my local chapter at Brooklyn was waging uh, a struggle alongside students on the campus against military recruitment. And that was during the second Gulf War, 2004, 2005. And then I started going to Albany and City Hall uh, and 80th Street at that point with faculty and staff and students to protest the tuition hikes. And so I was hooked and I've been active uh, in the PSC ever since then. And I think my observations will really dovetail with previous remarks. I don't want to duplicate them. And I'll, I'll just, to, just to summarize a couple of threads I want to pull out, which is that as a union, what you can see in that history that Bill just rehearsed and, and the remarks that others have shared is that we have always waged a really ambitious contract campaign. And we've always sought to improve the wages and the benefits for our members. And we've always fought really hard to enforce everything that we win in the contract, but we've never been content to just do those things. And we've always linked all of those struggles to the struggle to improve the, 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 the learning conditions for our students and more broadly to uplift the working class in New York City and beyond. And that's a vision that draws our members to the union and it engages them in our collective work. And it, it's motivated by the idea, and you, you saw this in one of the slides that was shared earlier, which is that another university is possible. And I know that we believe that. And you know, there are a couple of threats that we haven't defeated yet, and we're gonna continue to have to work on these, but we have made progress. And you heard a bit about them already. We have not yet defeated the largest threat to our sector and it's contingency. And it's not unique to our sector, right? You hear about the gig economy, we have the gig academy and other people have talked about adjunctification and we haven't defeated it yet, but the consistency, right? The persistence, Marsha Newfield put it, um, with which the PSC has approached that problem and um, the ingenuity, I would say, with which we have approached the issue that ha they have both allowed us to make real headway on that front. We have not defeated structural racism in CUNY, much less in New York City. But again, the consistency with which we have named it um, and the ingenuity with which we have pursued it have um, allowed us to make real headway on that. And this leadership is just as committed um, on that front as well. And underlying all of this, Right, I think is the principle that others have spoken to eloquently today, which is that we all deserve professional respect, professional dignity in our workplace, no matter our rank, no matter our title, whether we're faculty members, whether we're professional staff, and we have always stood strong for that principle. If I were to do the slideshow and enumerate highlights and stuff, we'd be here all day. I'm not going to do it. There's been a lot of punctuation marks, um, even in the recent right, recent couple of years, and Bill alluded to a few of them at the end, and so I, I, I won't uh, repeat them. Uh, you know, the Janus struggle has been very important. Uh, the New Deal for CUNY and the CUNY Rise and Alliance. Um, the end of the Cuomo era, 
And I, I, if I would put a question mark around that, because who knows what that lizard is going to do. But, you know, um, I, you know, one of the first conversations that I had when, um, when Cuomo, you know, was pushed out was, uh, I talked to Barbara and I said, you know, I really, I wish you had been around long enough because this Barbara's leadership and others, you know, had to deal with this guy, um, to use a generous term for him, for so long. And there's a way in, in which, you know, Kathy Hochul is not the salvation to any of our problems, but, you know, fighting Cuomo tooth and nail for so many years and to be out from under that, um, you know, I, I feel lucky to, you know, to have been handed the reins at a time when we can take advantage um, and, and have the, the kinds of institutions and infrastructure built that we can really take advantage now in a new way, given the tools that have been handed to us by our predecessors. And now we have, of course, COVID and we have health and safety crisis, but we have also have the incredible campaign, Save Lives, Save Jobs, Save CUNY, and the incredible health and safety um, committee that we inherited. We have, yes, we have the Medicare Advantage fiasco, but what leadership and what activism, you know, came out of that struggle and, and made real dent in, in that. And we're not done fighting on that one. So let me just say this as we reflect back on these past 50 years, I, I have to say, I am really hopeful um, about the years in front of us. We have new generations of activists and member leaders. And thanks to you all who have really cultivated and fostered those next generation of leaders, because really we're standing on your shoulders and we inherit from you a strong union and a vibrant institution, the likes of which are really hard to find anywhere in this country in higher education. And that is just true. So I wanna just close by recognizing the 50 year PSC members, many of you in the Zoom room with us today, I wanna to thank you for your commitment to the organization, to the union, and to the labor movement. Thank you for helping to build really what is this venerable institution. It's the most important vehicle that we have to deliver on that vision that another university is possible. So thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's event and congratulations to all the 50 year members and to all of us. Thanks again. Thank you so much, James. Um, and that is a segue, I think, into uh, asking Samantha to scroll down our 50 year honor roll. We have nearly 150 people on that. And those are just the people who let us know. So let's see the names of our 50 year plus members. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Can it be made a little bigger? Great. Thank you, Samantha. Very, very impressive list. Um, and I'm sure we have more people who haven't even identified themselves yet. Well, it's been a long program, I know that, um, but we need to now invite members of, not the audience, members in the room 
um, to speak at our open mic segment um, by lining up at the mic. And the way you do that uh, in these Zoom rooms is you raise your Zoom hand. And uh, in a minute, I think Samantha will uh, explain exactly how to do that for those of us who don't know. Um, we're going to be limiting the uh, time frame to a minute and a half for each of you. And I know that's not very much time, but we want to allow everyone a chance to speak. Um, and as people are lining up, um, the first person that I'm going to call on uh, is Laura Glass. And Laura Glass is one of Bell Zeller's nieces. And we are very honored and happy to have her here today. So um, before we hear from Laura, can you just please, Samantha, remind people how they uh, raise their hands to be part of the queue uh, for the open mic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, for those of you on your computers, um, down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a reactions button right next to a participants button normally. Um, and you'll click on that reactions and you'll see a raise hand option. Um, and then if you're on your phones, you will dial star nine. And then you can always reach out to me in the chat if you need any help. Okay, so is uh, Laura Glass in the house? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Hi. Um, I'm going to read something that my sister wrote because she wasn't able to be on this call and then something that I wrote and we're addressing her, our personal uh, views of our Aunt Bell as opposed to our professional ones. So this is from my sister. It's a little offbeat. My Aunt Bell will always be Aunt Bell to me. She was always going to meetings and at the end of these meetings, there were usually a lot of leftovers. I benefited from these leftovers because Aunt Bell went nowhere without a plastic bag in her handbag. I could come home and find a package of bread on my table, which said to me, look in your refrigerator, corned beef, turkey, roast beef, a feast. One day I said to her jokingly, could you bring me some coleslaw and pickles next time? And Belle actually considered this for a minute. And Belle would have starved if not for all the meetings she attended. She was not a cook. She never had food in her refrigerator. <sighs> and this is um, some of my thoughts on her. There really isn't much that I can say about her that others don't already know. So I'm going to tell you a little about her personal side. She considered the west side of Manhattan its best part and lived there her entire life. She was the best aunt imaginable. She loved introducing us to interesting places in Manhattan. She and I took trips to Washington, D.C., Williamsburg, Virginia, and Maine, and went to many museums in the city. She loved Broadway musicals and went to many. She adored her family and opened her home to all of us repeatedly. She loved Chinese food. She was a terrible cook and totally inept when it came to any type of gadgetry. She traveled the world. Whenever she went someplace new, she would go to the zoo, not so much to see the animals, but because she loved to see families interacting. I think about her and I miss her every day. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, that's a great tribute. And I think as we all work together uh, for longer and longer periods, we learn a lot about each other in personal ways uh, because we're not just 
PSC unionists, we have rich lives and varied lives. And certainly hearing this about Bell is, is, was very enjoyable. Thank you. Well, sure. I see uh, there's a big lineup at the mic uh, and I only see one person and that's the wonderful Marvel Lily who uh, has uh, been our, for many years, our secretary at the retirees chapter and currently serves along with Nancy Romer on our, on the PSC wide executive council. So Marva. Oh, thank you, Ann. Bill, it has been a joy serving under your leadership do, during the past nine years. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to work with you in planning our semi-annual luncheons. And after the passing of Judy, I forgot her last name, and also assisting in the pre-retirement pre meetings. You deserve all the accolades echo today. And it is fitting that this celebration fell on this date. Congratulations and happy birthday. Thank you, Marva. Well, I, I, I see everybody uh, is, is speechless. Um, as a teacher, I learned to wait a few minutes and give my students some think time before opening my mouth. So is there anybody else who would like to say anything today? Okay, well, I don't, I don't see any other hands. Um, in closing, uh, I think it's a credit to the vitality and import of our PSC that after 50 years, we still stand strong and united, representing all the many, many constituencies that Bill highlighted and Barbara highlighted. And it's, uh, it's a challenge, but it's a joy to be part of this organization. Uh, we move forward facing many hurdles before us as we rejoice in our victories. I think we are in wonderful hands with our new president, James. Um, and in particular, the retiree chapter will continue to play an important role as it always has done, providing the history, the expertise and the talent of our members. So there are many people to thank uh, I'm sure I'm going to miss somebody, but I'll start, of course, by thanking all of our speakers and all of you who attended today's special meeting, all the 50 year members, those of you who contributed uh, wonderful pieces to our latest Turning the Page edition. I read all your, your recollections and, and it was really quite enlightening for me to hear your stories. Um, I very much appreciated Bill um, highlighting the importance of the PSC staff through the years and how fundamental the PSC staff is to the work of our union. When I taught at BMCC, uh, BMCC at the beginning anyway, was one building and it was seven stories high. I don't know what happened on the seventh floor, but the sixth floor was all the big wigs, you know, the administrators and, um, you know, maybe a few departments and a few classrooms. But I would come in to BMCC on the ground floor because I parked my car and I you know, would walk in and on the ground floor was buildings and grounds. Buildings and grounds uh, uh, staff were not part of our union, but they are unionized. And I always felt that the staff on the ground floor in B and G were fundamental, not just being 
physically on the foundation, but are the foundation by with which not whom with nothing else can be done. And I would say the same about our own staff. So in particular today, Samantha Sherry and John Herrick, who helped uh, the technical side of this meeting, uh, Fran Clark and his communications team, uh, Amanda, whose last name I know I am gonna mangle, but I will try, Amanda Maghalis. Uh, I'd like to drink, thank our retiree program committee, the executive committee, um, and all of us together who keep our union alive and well. So with that, we're gonna close out with, you'll never guess, but we're gonna close out with solidarity forever. And um, I think a Pete Seeger rendition, and I think Connie's going to lead us in a spirited uh, singing of that uh, classic. And so I think Samantha, you're going to unmute everybody is, if you can. She's done it, she's done it. She's done it, okay. So let's hear Pete. That's great. Hold on one second while I get this up. <clears throat> I'm sorry, what is that? Okay, well maybe, uh, Bonnie, are you there? Yes, I am. Well, maybe you could start us a cappella while we're okay. waiting for the music. Well, <laughs> Union mm -hmm. inspiration mm -hmm. through the work that puts it there. There can be no, no way to be anywhere, but it's not that what it was on earth. And the feeble strength of one, the union is strong. 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 The union That's because we haven't yet formed our PSC chorus. <laughs> another thing that we have to do and uh, in the future. And thank you so much, everybody, for a wonderful meeting. Um, it, it, you know, it's so, so rich, so rich, the program. Yes. And... Um, Let's see everybody. You know, I don't really want to leave, but 
Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye